Assalamu alaikum. So, in light of Black History Month, I wanted to talk a little bit about Malcolm X, personal role model and inspiration for many, actually. There's a lot to say, of course. He was a civil rights leader, he was an activist, a public speaker, a religious figure, but he was a lot more than all that. But before I get ahead of myself, let's go back to the very beginning. Malcolm X, or Malcolm Little, was born in 1925 in Nebraska. His father, was a courageous and confident speaker in his local church. And he was of the thought that African Americans were in fact Africans that ought to return back to Africa. Their slogan was Africa for the Africans. And his influencer was Marcus Garvey, a black thought leader. So Earl Little, Malcolm X's father, was threatened for his life multiple times during Malcolm's upbringing. And in fact, even before Malcolm's birth, um, their house was burnt and eventually they were driven out of the city. Malcolm X's father took his wife and kids from house to house and doing their best to escape from the KK, KKK and other white supremacist groups in that area, Michigan and so on. Eventually, um, Earl Little's body was found on the train tracks. And of course, the local police, firemen, all that said, you know, it's just an accident. Anyways. That's the first chapter of Malcolm X's story, and it, it, keeps, it keeps getting more and more exciting. So what happens is a social worker eventually takes Malcolm X and his siblings away from the mother because she just couldn't take it all. The stress was too much. She was eventually put into a, into a mental asylum, which she stayed for like the next 26 years. Um, Malcolm was raised up in, an, in, a, in a foster home, you know, separated from his brothers and sisters. And he did really well in school, all right? He was the, he was the class representative or class president. He uh, top grades, you know, well loved and respected by everybody in his class. Uh, and in seventh grade, his teacher asks him and everyone else in the class, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And Malcolm X, naturally, you know, his personality and so on, he said he wanted to be a lawyer. But his teacher, well intentioned, I presume, said, no, come on, you got to be more realistic. In here, we all love you as in class, but out there, and then he uses the N word to remind Malcolm and to, I guess, knock sense into him, telling him that in our society, we really don't accept people of your type. So, so Malcolm eventually leaves school. I mean, why, why bother, right? I mean, you're taught by your class. If you can't get to where you want, then just... Anyways, he ends up on the streets and joins gangs, right? He goes from major city to major city, from Boston, New York, and other places. And pretty, pretty much, he does it all. Eventually, some years later, he ends up being caught. Him and a few friends were stealing from rich people's houses. And he was caught and put in prison for seven years. And you might think like, wow, that sucks, right? Like, okay, he committed those crimes, but what a tough upbringing. And like, that's, that's kind of cool. And it sucks. But in fact, it was the best thing that could have happened to him. Later on in his life, he would refer back to these times when I guess in his 20s, where he was in prison. And he would say, you know, that was my university. That was my degree. That was my education. It was in prison. State penitentiary. I think it was Indiana State Penitentiary and so on. Amazing, right? He reads like, Every book he could get his hands on, there was like a library in the prison and he would just spend all day reading. In fact, he wears glasses later on because his eyesight, he got a lot weaker when he was reading with like, you know, dimly lit rooms and so on. He was reading all day, all night, as much as he can. Uh, geography, history, law and politics, all that stuff, philosophy. Eventually he comes out of prison, right? He behaved well and so on. He comes out and uh, again, I got ahead of myself. In prison, two important things. One is he decides to read all these books, but two... He met a guy that tells him about this new religion. It was a religion for black folks, and it was called the Nation of Islam. All right, so in America, Islam, as in the 1400-year-old religious tradition um, that over one and a half billion people follow today, Muslims, wasn't really well known right in the US at that time. But the Nation of Islam was this, this new religion, you can say, that was started up by someone named Elijah Muhammad. And he basically claimed to be a prophet of God. Right, that God spoke to him directly and he was basically the next prophet and so on, which is of course very contrary to orthodox Islamic belief. But anyway, this is, this is important to learn in terms of history. And um, it really appealed to blacks because they, were, they taught that white men was the devil, black were the original race chosen by God, you know, the, black pro the prophet was black, Elijah Muhammad and so on. Anyway, eventually this, this group gains, gains prominence and Malcolm X was part of that. He leaves prison, meets Elijah Muhammad, becomes one of the preachers, ministers of the nation of Islam probably the most well-known, and you know, he was an order, very well-spoken, he would attract crowds. Um, the news and the media and everything picked him up, they would love to hear his lectures and ask him questions, and he was excellent at answering questions. So he would go around and he'd build temples all across the nation, right? 
and um, eventually gets married, right? Sister Betty, who was one of the sisters, one of the ladies in, in the nation of Islam. And they have many daughters together, I think four, and then eventually six, two more after his death. Um, so he, he goes around, builds, builds, um, builds temples and um, what they called um, preach, preaching or outreach or dawah, they called it uh, fishing. So basically he would recruit people and he was excellent at that. Uh, during this time, one of the most monumental things in his life happened, which was that he was sponsored and encouraged to go to Mecca to give the pilgrimage, right? Which is something that Muslims do at least once in their lifetime if they can. And Muslims have been doing it for the centuries. And I doubt if anybody had done it from the US before his time. And if so, probably very few. But he goes. And this was, for him, this was amazing. Because for years now, he had been preaching, you know, whites, blacks. As they say, he made it really clear. He made things really black and white. It was all about whites and blacks and racism which is, of course, um, a critical issue of the time, and still is. It's one of the themes throughout U.S. history and U.S. politics. And I did forget to mention this, that during the 60s and 70s, the civil rights movement, which many many of our generation are very familiar with, the issue was equality, was equal access to schools and, and, um, and institutions and so on. Um, but what we really don't know or what we don't hear about as much what we, what's harder for us to imagine is that the 1920s, 10s, 20s, 30s, and so on, which is Malcolm X's father's time, in fact, um, the issues were even more severe. It was lynching, wasn't so uncommon, right? Um, that a group, in this case a white mob, would grab, would grab somebody and basically force them on the cross and burn them alive and so on, and it was disgusting. Hang them, kill them. So yeah, so he, he spends, and he knows this, this is his upbringing, this is where he grows up around, and in his times, 50s, 60s, etc., uh, 40s, 50s, uh, things are still pretty bad, right? Slavery had ended, what, like almost 100 years before that, but you know, you definitely were not seeing any equality. So yeah, so he's preaching, he goes to Hajj, he goes to pilgrimage, goes to Mecca, and he sees, today it's like three million people, at that time it was probably a lot smaller, but hundreds of thousands of people, right? If not a million, from all over the world. Muslims, but that was pretty much the only common denominator. Whites, blacks, yellow, orange, blue, red, blue, everything, right? Every possible color, people coming from all over the world. And different socioeconomic status, different everything, different languages, probably like 100, 200 languages spoken there, if not more. But they were all there for a common purpose. They were all there to worship God. And he saw that they worshiped together. They ate together, prayed together, talked to each other as much as possible. They went from place to place, slept together. You know, there's, it's like a campsite. Anyway, maybe someday in the future we'll talk more about Hajj so you can imagine it. But I'm sure if you go to Google Images and you search Hajj Pilgrimage Mecca, you'll, you can get, a, get an idea of the magnitude and the, and the, uh, the size and the, uh, yeah. It's an impressive sight. I've actually been lucky to, to go myself. But this was definitely... <clears throat> A landmark time, a landmark incident in his life because it changed the way he saw things. And luckily for us, although he died very soon afterwards, so towards the end of his life at like 37, 38 years old, and he gets assassinated at 39, luckily for us during that pilgrimage, he wrote letters back to Sister Betty, which he read to the congregation and which we have till today. And he talked about how it was amazing that he's praying next to somebody who has blue eyes, right? In America, the blue eyed, yellow haired, blonde haired person was like the enemy. So he's like, there's a white person behind me, a black person, brown person, white person, etc. And it was, it was impressive for him. So he realized basically that, you know, this is way bigger than us, right? So race is an issue we're dealing with, but Islam is this 1,400-year-old tradition. And he learned more about Orthodox Islam and realized that nation Islam was kind of this, this made-up thing, right? This idea of a new prophet, it was false theology. Although, and obviously I didn't go into all the details, I'm trying to condense his life, and I definitely recommend the autobiography of Malcolm X by Spike Lee, his book. But um, among the details I skipped is the fact that nation Islam wasn't just recruiting people and just teaching them or brainwashing them to this new theology. They were cleaning them up, all right? And this was something that was really appealing to blacks at the time. They were cleaning them up because a lot of them were addicted to drugs and alcohol, etc. And they got them to leave pork, leave adultery, leave alcohol, drugs, all that stuff. Really cleaning them up, right? And building communities and trying to be self-sufficient and serving others and etc. So around this time, he comes back from the pilgrimage and he realizes that, you know, while he was very sincere and, I mean, others were in trying to recruit people to what they thought was the truth. In fact, it wasn't technically the truth. And there were corrupt individuals involved, right? So that eventually leads to a split. The Nation of Islam continues as it is under Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm X basically leads this new group, right? Who were trying to return back to roots, uh, what it meant to be uh, to be Muslim. And um, also learning about their tradition as Africans, African Americans. Trying to work with others, which was different, right? Because before that, Malcolm X would basically reject any white person from the, joining the group. Because he really saw it as, you know, whites versus blacks. Whites were the devil. And he realized that, you know, this was nonsense. That it's not really about skin or language or ethnicity or culture, etc. But it's about worshiping God, about serving humanity, and so on and so forth. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, 
it was God's plan that he would be assassinated at 39 years old within like a year or less than a year after he comes back from pilgrimage. And the effects of his life can still be felt today. I mean, he's, he's inspired so many. His biography is one of the most read autobiographies, period. So why bring this up, right? Why are we talking about this? One, it's Black History Month, obviously. But, I mean, there, are no, there, aren't short, there is no shortage of inspirational um, black figures or black historical personalities, you can say. I chose Malcolm X because he was very proud of being black, of his ethnicity, of his race, of his color. Also very, pl very proud of his religion, very proud of being Muslim, right? He was possibly the most influential black Muslim ever, him and maybe Muhammad Ali, who I'll probably discuss in a, in a future video, and their lives do intersect, and it is exciting. Um, and this is very um, relevant for us today, because although this was decades ago, his life is commonly brought up in the context of Islamophobia, white supremacy, and so on, and the political culture today. Um, American society is very different than it was at that time, um, but it's not completely different. Some of the issues are still here today. Um, and that's, again, for another time. But one of the issues that I consider to be critical, close to heart, one of the things that I love to talk about, and you can go find some of our videos on YouTube, uh, Islamophobia and the youth, right? So my generation. So um, I like to give a lecture about Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and our generation. And it's, it'll be given in a few days. Studies have shown that young people growing up, being taught either directly or indirectly, that they have to choose between being Muslim or, and being American, that they can't have it both ways. And I've actually heard that in person to my face. You just can't have it both ways. Um, naturally grow, grow up with fear, anxiety, uh, maybe even animosity and resentment. Uh, they grow up um, not being proud. They grow up not being confident. And that has a whole host of issues um, that affect the individual, families, and society. And for all those reasons and many more, I chose to you know, speak about Malcolm X for a few minutes. A lot more can be said. Hopefully this is the first of many. Assalamu alaikum.